Our first reading is from Luke <laughs> chapter 1, the Annunciation, the angel Gabriel coming to Mary. In the sixth month of her cousin Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel since I am a virgin. So growing up in uh, New York City, this is a little known fact, um, there are more Jewish people living in Queens than in the city of Jerusalem. And there are more Jewish people that live in the city of New York than in all of the nation of Israel. Um, that was a fascinating statistic that I heard. Um, and so I grew up in an apartment with lots of Jewish neighbors. And so I know the sound of an irritated Jewish mother. <laughs> I've heard it at great volume at times in the conversations that sometimes arise from very, very stressful situations. <laughs> now, it's certainly safe to say, isn't it, that Mary in this moment and in the moments we'll portray for you here is in, um, in, in one of those moments. And we're going to discover what Mary made of them. It's, uh, we, we position these readings in certain ways. We're ending them in certain ways, not so that they all cinch up in a neat little bow. The last word you heard from this reading was, how can this be? And I wonder, you know, for many of us, if we were in the situation just like Mary, how might we perceive what Mary ultimately sees as treasure? I'm afraid for myself, speaking for myself, in these moments, and perhaps even Mary, certainly Joseph, were tempted in this way that we might see as it being an irritant or an obstacle, a hurdle, or even as trash instead of treasure. It might be something that steals joy. Instead, in Mary's heart and in her faith, they become treasures, which I hope that we share tonight. When Gabriel announced the birth of the promised Messiah to Mary, it is right that all generations would not only call her blessed, but that they would also wonder, stand in awe at her gracious and her humble, faithful response. A treasure, this announcement? Well, maybe for some of us in hindsight, it's a miraculous birth, but for Mary, unmarried, poor, from a town that's not even noted on Jewish or Roman maps, this announcement could have led to an exclamation something like this. God, how could you do this to me? Don't you know what people will say? Don't you know how my family and I will be humiliated and shunned? Don't you know? And of course the answer is yes. He does know. God knows full well what people will say to the child she carries. They will reject him. They will beat him. They will cry out, crucify him. And in that mixture of hope and hurt and promise comes the treasure of every redeemed and faithful heart who trusts in the love and promise of God our Savior. Oh God, don't you know what people will say? What will people say of Mary? They will call her faithful. They will call her blessed. They will call her highly favored that she might bear the one who will save us all. Well, what will come of this situation now with Joseph and Mary being betrothed to be married. 
And how will Joseph respond to an unimaginable situation? We read from Matthew chapter 1. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Now because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. So what could Mary's response be now? It may have been something like, my life is over. My life is over. A young teenage girl who had been betrothed to a man who was a carpenter by trade, was going to be able to take care of her and raise a family together. And now, her life is over. All the plans that may have been in place, all the hopes and thoughts of what life might look like, no longer an option for Mary. And she has this man, Joseph, who was going to be her husband, now saying, not anymore. Not now. In fact, he says, I will divorce her. And, and in still an effort to take care of her and not disgrace her, says, I'll do it quietly. But we are not going to be married. That's what Joseph says to Mary. And so now, before, really, I mean, even before she is married, it's over. Divorced. And unwanted. And who would want Mary now? How are we going to explain this? And so Mary is facing loneliness all alone in a world and in a culture where she didn't have options, where she didn't have a way to make it on her own. She was dependent upon a man who would care for her and give her security and love and faithful provision. And so now she is divorced, unwanted, and alone. And maybe her question would go something like this. What will happen to me now? What treasure can possibly be seen in this? What will happen to me now? But notice what the Word says about Joseph. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful. It says at first, faithful to the law. But what God provided for Mary was a faithful man. A faithful husband who would care for her provide for her and also then actively engage in raising her son, Jesus. And so he says to Mary that she would still be his wife and that they would still come together. And it would be Mary and Joseph raising Jesus together. And so we still could ask the question, right? What will happen to me now? I find it a marvelous and miraculous picture of how Jesus later speaks about how He loves His bride, the church, faithful, faithfully providing for, faithfully giving security, faithfully loving and showing grace and mercy. So here we have in this very beginning, Joseph being a picture with his wife Mary of how Christ loves the church, provides security, grace, love, and forgiveness for His bride, the church. What will happen to me now? Mary treasures a relationship based on faith and faithfulness. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So an angel tells me I'm going to have a baby without the benefit of a husband, and then I have a husband who tells me as gently as possible that he will divorce me, and now you're asking me to do what?
you wonder if the timing could be any worse. Mary might pose questions in her mind. Why can't they just count us here in Nazareth? Or maybe even in Sepphoris. They're, they're only after the little money that we don't have. And so Mary, running headlong and head first into the value of the Roman Empire, how can she begin to compare economies? Noting that the Roman census and the requirement to go to Bethlehem defines how the Roman Empire measures treasure. But that is not God's economy. To the Romans, they sought to count everyone in their kingdom to place a price upon the value of each one and then extract that price from them. But God's economy is different. God seeks to count each one of us, not to extract a price from us, but that we might know how he counts treasure in every human heart that trusts in his love and promise and that the price is one he is willing and eager to pay, a price he pays in the gift of his son our Savior Jesus Christ. This is the treasure that God counts and that Mary received, a treasure which he calls by name. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth to Galilee, to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. Just imagine that conversation. After the decree goes out, Joseph comes to Mary and says, Mary, we've got to go to Bethlehem. Really? Really? And now you can't be serious. Have you noticed I'm expecting a child? Right? We have to travel 90 miles to Bethlehem on just trails, walking in various, the tundra and the tree. I mean, just the, it is not a pleasant journey. And I don't like Bethlehem anyway, right? Because Mary may have said something like, I don't even like your family. <laughs> well, you come from the line of David. I don't, why do we have to go to Bethlehem? As Pastor Dinger just mentioned, why can't we do it somewhere else? Really? Joseph, this is your fault. This is your fault, Joseph. I'm not happy about this journey that we must go on, and the timing couldn't be worse. But you know, what Mary does is she finds treasure in the journey. And then she also can find treasure in the destination. Because journeys are important for our faith. Jesus Christ, as He walked on this earth and as He called disciples to follow Him and the crowds came, over and over again, it was about a journey to faith in Christ. And so even Mary had her journey that she traveled on. The experiences along the way, the trusting in a merciful and loving and gracious God to keep His promises. And that is, in fact, what God was doing. He had promised through the prophet that this child would be born in the town of Bethlehem. And so He uses maybe unusual means at times, means that don't always make sense to us. Maybe they didn't make sense to Mary in that moment. The Roman government was serving God in calling for a census that required a journey to Bethlehem at just the right time so that Jesus would be born in just the right place. And so the journey, the journey is really about faith. And we are on our own journeys. And God is keeping His promises because He is faithful and He leads us to the destination where He wants us to come to. A destination 
where God fulfills all His promises. Every promise He has made is a yes in Jesus Christ. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. You know, Joseph, if I had made those reservations, there would have been a room ready. (laughs) How long did you know that we needed a place to stay? And that comment about the in-laws, that's pretty good. Maybe they didn't get along. A place that's clean and warm, a place where there might be a midwife around, maybe that could be available to us. Isn't this your hometown, Joseph? How could you think so little of me that you would be so ill-prepared for this night? But the reservation had been made for Mary and for the birth of our Savior. 700 years before this very night, God made a reservation in Bethlehem, the least of the tribes and places of Israel, so small it almost went unnoticed. God made his reservation there in a stable, probably a cave with just farm animals. Imagine the smell with shepherds who would be welcome to a place like that, but who would have been turned away from the Marriott or the Hilton in a place where the lowly are lifted up and the mighty cast down from their thrones. For this treasure that Mary saw is the one that says that the child she carried would come for all people. From the least to the greatest, from the highest king to the lowliest shepherd boy, Jesus Christ is Savior to us all. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, A great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. Joseph, please make them go away. Can we just blow out the candle and act like nobody's home? I don't want to see one more person. Nobody seemed to care when we were looking for a place to stay, and now we can't get a moment of peace and quiet. Maybe that could have been Mary's response and as mentioned already if the animals weren't bad enough and smelly and the surroundings awkward as they may have been now we have smelly shepherds showing up awkward and lacking social skills right and maybe mary said to joseph i just want some rest i just need some rest it was a 90 mile hike And now we're in a stable, a cave. I've just given birth. I just need some rest. And here, now all of a sudden, can't get any rest. Can't get left alone. But ultimately, of course, of course the treasure is this. That Jesus Christ is the one who gives rest. Jesus says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So while the shepherds showed up, 
And they needed to see this thing that had happened in Bethlehem, the Savior who had been born. Now this Savior will become the rest for Mary and for Joseph and the shepherds and for all of us. He is the one who will give us peace and rest. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. You know, I want to get one thing straight. I've, this season I seem to have heard more and more about people being critical of us having wise men around on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day because they couldn't have been there till about a year or two later. No one knows. Let's get this straight. All it says is they went to the house. How long do you think they lived in that stable, by the way? That could be the very next morning that they found a room in the Motel 6 and then the wise men showed up. So it's fine if you have wise men in your nativity set. I'm just giving you permission. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, but what I really want to do is say, now we're talking about some treasure, aren't we? Now we've got this treasure thing right. Because the wise men brought some gold and some myrrh and some incense, invaluable, priceless things. Uh, you know, you can't spend the choruses of the angel choirs of the, or the prayers of the shepherds, but gold, now we're talking. But you know, maybe you've even seen a comic or two that talks about just how wise these wise men really were as they brought gifts to the infant Jesus. Some have speculated that on what the wise women would have brought. Tim Hawkins, is, who's one of my favorite Christian comics, he jokes about this because he said as a kid, you know, he would sing the song, Do you hear what I hear? Right? He says that song is crazy because in there it's like, A child, a child shivers in the night. Right? And he says, Let us bring him silver and gold. Oh, shivers in the cold. Sorry. Thanks, honey. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Not only is my voice giving out, my mind is as well. So anyway, a child shivers in the cold. Let us bring him silver and gold. How about a blanket? How about some soup? Right? So that's what the wise women might have brought. The moms. But Mary treasured uh, this visit from the wise men as well. A visit that did, in fact, bring great comfort in the value of those gifts, which actually allowed them to live and raise their son in safety away from the dangers of Herod, the mad king, but which in a far more significant way showed the true value of the infant that she clung to so tightly. For the king she held was far greater than any of the three kings who showed up. And their gifts told a greater story. Gold for the king of kings, incense for the priest who intercedes on our behalf in love, and myrrh, a burial spice, to mark the great sacrifice Jesus would make on a cross to bring salvation to every believing heart. There is one more verse to read. When 
Joseph and Mary bring Jesus to the temple, the elderly Simeon says, Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. What Mary treasured was what she held in her arms. And yet the greatest of all treasure would be what this child would accomplish on a, Roman's cro on a Roman cross and a rising from a rich man's tomb. A cross would pierce his heart and hers, but an empty tomb would signal a victory that only this tiny infant could achieve. There was no greater treasure indeed. This is the greatest of all gifts.